so much and uh, hi and welcome everybody to this month's Music Bar None. Today we are carrying on our Faenza Marathon and performing the next eight pieces in the manuscript. For those of you who are interested, we already did a part one and I'll put a link in the description down below. And in those first eight pieces we perform lots of beautiful pieces by Masho and the ever-famous Anonymous. And I also did a deep dive into the history and the context of the Faenza Codex. So if you're super interested, go and watch that video. But just as a small recap for anyone in the audience tonight who wasn't there and isn't a medieval specialist, the Faenza Codex is a very important and rare example of written out keyboard music which has survived to today. There was a practice of the time of taking famous polyphony and arranging it for keyboard instruments and as most of the music at the time was three-part vocal music, what they did is they took the main lower line, the tenor voice, and they put it in the left hand, and they took the higher cantus melody line and they put it in the right hand, and then they made it super, super ornamented because that fits really nicely on a keyboard. And they left out the third voice because it's not so important harmonically, and the third voice tends to add some salt and pepper and some spice, and when you've got so many notes here, you don't really need anything extra. It's enough. It's got enough chili, really, going on. So that's what happens in the Faenza Codex and why we consider it so important today. Sadly, we don't actually have a keyboard instrument that's suitable for the Faenza Codex tonight. We have a keyboard instrument, but the range means it's only kind of enough for one hand, a left or a right. You can't really, can't really fit both on. So we're kind of going meta, and we're taking this keyboard music that was originally three-part vocal music, and we're again separating it out, and we're putting the left hand on one instrument and the right hand on another instrument and performing it with different combinations and enjoying the chance to play lots of really fast notes on our recorders and other instruments. Um, in the Faenza Codex, there's kind of three genres. You have quite a lot of religious music that was ornamented this way. There's also a section of French chanson, and then there's also an Italian part. And so far, we started with the French part, and we've done like the first part of the French part, and now we're doing the second part of the French part, which will then con conclude that. So next time, when we do the third part of this Faenza marathon, it will be onto the Italian Trecento repertoire, which I'm looking forward to, because that's one of my favourite genres. So tonight, what we're going to try and always do is mix up the original version and also then add in the Faenza version. And I'm really happy that I have Julia and Arthur, and Julia and Antonio here to <laughs> here to uh, to play with to play and uh, play some of the original versions. And then Fiona and I, we're the masochists, and we're the ones who are doing all the fast notes. So therefore, I would like to invite Fiona and Julia to join me to do the first piece. So I'm just going to uh, just say a few words about this first piece. It's, it's mega famous and it's got many different names in many different manuscripts and also it's in really quite a wide range of different types of manuscripts. You find them in... Um, in Austria and Tyrol and Italy in these, these big manuscripts full of lots of chansons, but you also find it in the Faenza, and you also find it notated in a ship trumpeter's notebook. There was this guy called Zotzi Trompetta who kept a diary and a log of what he was doing while he was on a ship, and he wrote down some pieces, and a version of, of this is also located there. So it's, it's kind of a really popular piece at the time. And it always perplexed me, because somewhere... Somebody once attributed it to Masho. And every time I played it, I was like, yeah, but this isn't Masho. This is really weird. This can't be Masho. Until I eventually found out that um, the manuscript in Strasbourg, which uh, a very famous musicologist, um, he managed to like, notate everything before the library burnt down and the manuscript was lost. And he wrongly, in his lists, attributed it to Masho, and then since then it sort of became this piece is by Masho, because it's nice to put a famous name to a piece, but uh, it's totally not. And when you hear it, if you know the style of Masho, you'll notice it's, it's really impossible to be by Masho. 
So we're going to do two versions. First of all, uh, Julia and Fiona will sing the original song, and then we'll do the Faenza. And I will just scoot out of the way to give you some space. <laughs> I'm going to swap recorders. So this next piece, um, Alas Monker, is very interesting because it's already appeared in the Faenza Codex. There's a version of this, which you can hear if you go and watch the first part. Um, it's based on the same tenor, uh, but it's a completely different uh, cantus part. It's basically a completely different piece, but based on the same original vocal model. Unfortunately, this is one of the pieces that hasn't been identified yet, so we don't actually know what the original chanson was like. But uh, it's also very nice just how it is.
amazing. She really took the brunt of most of the top lines in this <laughs> program. I kind of realised afterwards. Oh. And uh, it's, it's really incredible. Incredible. Yeah. Okay. I thought she was going to take off. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I thought she was going to stop breathing. <laughs> yeah, I, I thought so too. <laughs> and especially, she's really like taking the effort and performing from the... Oh. <laughs> Very impressive. Very, very, very impressive. So we're going to move on to the next piece in the codex. I'm trying to be quite consistent and also virtually always following the order. And we have um, a really epic, beautiful piece. It was also very, very popular at the time. And Julia is going to come and we're going to mix up the Faenza and the original because it's a ballata form, which... For those sitting in the audience who can't remember, <laughs> sorry, I'm sitting in front of like mainly only medievalists, so it's kind of, I really feel like I'm talking to the converted. But uh, but this for it has a very distinct form, normally of. Actually, I'm, I'm not going to say anything. Just enjoy this one. I'm going to explain it when we do it after the cocktail, because a I'll be drunker, and uh, and we do something we we don't follow the form exactly how it should be, so it's not a clear example. But anyway, we're mixing up the original and the fine so, what do I need to play in this? Oh, yes, I do say it. <laughs> and I have to play a F, which is the bigger one. And I should maybe say, maybe, do you want to say the title? Because you you always say things more beautifully. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> it's De Duto Sei. So beautiful. I know. <laughs> And uh, can I have an F to see if I'm
I was been a part of this incident. <laughs> I'm so trying to definitely need a cocktail now. And uh, as you can see, that's why we kind of mixed the original and the Fianza together, because if we did the whole form of the original and then the whole form of the Fianza, that would have been the whole concert by itself. <laughs> However beautiful it is. So, first of all, I'm going to take my instruments away so they don't get sticky. And we're going to move on to the most important part of the evening, which is, of course, the cocktails. <laughs> So, I thought I'd make something quite seasonal. You know, we're in February, I think most of us have been ill. I was ill a couple of weeks ago and I'm still coughing and sniffing. So this cocktail is actually very healthy. It has a lot of lemon and honey and some gin as well, just to, <laughs> to make it drinkable. And it was actually a uh, it was actually a prohibition cocktail. So that's one of the cocktails that was um, invented in the twenties and thirties when, basically in America, you couldn't officially drink alcohol. So they all kind of went down underground and they created speakeasies and they created lots of very sweet, yummy cocktails to hide the fact that most of the alcohol was really awful because it was totally bootleg, bootleg and. Um, and illegal, so uh, that's why we now have so many cocktails today. It's basically all coming out of this prohibition era. So actually, thanks America for <laughs> closing down the alcohol. It had some, it had some reason after all. So this is called a bee's knees, I guess because of the honey, but also bee's knees is an expression in English which means kind of it's the best. If you're the bee's knees or it's the bee's knees, it's kind of the best thing. So maybe this will be the best cocktail we'll have of the season. You never know. So, if anyone's interested in the real recipe, they, I will put a link below, but just so you know, it's kind of easy, it's, it's uh, five, what's this, yes, five centiliters of gin, five centiliters of lemon, and then like half the amount of honey, I made a kind of a honey syrup so it dissolves quicker, and I have put that in this shaker. I'm going to go and add some ice and then I'm going to shake it around and we will have a really nice cocktail. And I made the mistake of putting the lid on the cocktail. <laughs> so. This is when we need a cocktail shaking anthem. We need a cocktail shaking anthem. <laughs> and then I'm going to invite Fiona and Julia and Antonio to join me and we can have a little chat about medieval life. I'm a bit scared. It might need more honey. You? you might find it kind of really sour. So, to the business. To the business. <laughs> <laughs> and I have enough for all you guys afterwards. As well. <laughs> Don't worry. Mm. It's nice. Actually, yeah. Mm. I would put maybe a tiny bit more honey. Yeah, I would yeah. think so. It's quite. <laughs> I can definitely taste the lemon. <laughs> 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 mm -hmm. 
So for the next round, for you guys, we'll, we'll tweak the recipe and add a bit more. Mm -hmm. Add a bit more honey. That's nice, no? Yeah, it's it feels like a very healthy thing. Yeah. Really. <laughs> I think I won't be coughing afterwards. So, um, last time we did the Fienza, obviously I had a lot of Fienza orientated questions, but I feel like we have someone new here, and Julie, you also haven't been around for a while, so we're just going to like have a chat about but life. life. <laughs> about <laughs> life. So, um, for instance, um, Arthur. Tell, tell me, yes. Arthur. <laughs> Arthur, tell me. You know, so I think if I could choose my name, I probably wouldn't choose my name, that's the truth. Yeah. Maybe that was what I was feeling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, you're new-ish at school? Right? I'm new-ish at school, I'm my, my second year. In your second year. My, my second and year. Uh, what, brought, why did you, what brought you to medieval music? What? That's a very interesting question, isn't it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I don't think it was one thing, though. I think it was sort of a, many things that sort of went together and then kind of led me. Because I, I studied before in Portugal and I studied recording. I studied, so inevitably, early music a bit. I didn't have much choice. Um, I think it was a sort of coming from... Also from my personal, more personal side, because I'm also sort of, com uh, com I also do composition. And I think mostly my, actually my, I think my main interest in medieval music started as a compositional mm. interest, in the sense of trying to understand uh, necessarily the thought behind it. Like, like, you know, the thought behind the music, how to make the music like the sort of rational framework with which the music is made. Because listening to music, it's, it's, you can listen to music and sort of listening now to med a medieval piece of music. You know, it's 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 still it's still more or less this, or at least we try to be the more the the, the same sound object as it was like five hundred years ago. As in, like, we are trying to rediscover what they were doing, not just like it's like no, we're doing. But that's the thing. But one thing is what they were doing. Another thing is. What they listened, what they were thinking, what they were doing, you know, like the sort so of mental the, frame. The context of it, not just like the context. Yeah, yeah, I'd say, and yeah, I think it started more like trying to understand more the sort of mental framework of it, and then. And do you find coming to Basel and to Skoda, which is obviously very intensely medieval, Intense. if you're doing that program, <laughs> has that been like giving you some answers or showing you some new ideas? I think it's mostly given more questions, but I think that's a good thing. Um, but yeah, I, I think definitely now that getting to do the music, sort of, sort of immerse in the music, like sort of, and doing like on a daily basis, yeah, definitely, lots of questions, lots of questions, but, um, and did you have a chance to play much of it before, or was it, was it still like a relatively oh, fresh genre when you it was, I think it was, I was, I think I was very alone, you know, also in, in a place, because it was a very particular interest and also personal interest, you know, I was, I was, I was the nerd. Uh, and here I got to be the nerd again, the like nerd among yes. nerds, fellow nerds. Yes. So um, I remember that feeling when I different. first came to school. Exactly, like, yeah. I was like, oh, I found my people, we're all nerds. <laughs> exactly, it's a, it, but, but, that's, but that's good, you know, having a community yeah. of nerds with which to do nerd stuff. Yeah, uh, yeah it's yeah. really beautiful, yeah. 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 Exactly. I mean, like, this is kind of the nerdiest thing you could, like, my, <laughs> my social life. No, I, I, think, I think this is, this is, yeah, this is what medieval music is all about, is <laughs> lemonade and... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And And Fianza. Yeah. yeah. And uh, Julie, you're kind of like, so you're relatively new at school and you're like kind of coming to the other side. I know this is like a big question, but how has your time at school been? Has it been... Interesting, are you glad you came? Uh, <laughs> this is this kind of figure two, so one shouldn't answer, answer <laughs> yes, questions. Yes, I'm glad I came. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, it's been long, like five years. It's, no, it was very interesting, lots of questions. I'm very happy to leave as well, because mm -hmm. it's a very small place. Mm. And it's good to leave at some point, but I don't know. Yes. I think that's often about studying in a way you come for answers, but or, I mean, it just shows you how many questions there are actually in the world. Like the more you know, the more you realise you don't know. It's mm. one of these interesting situations. And Fiona, we've been now doing quite a lot of this in tabulation, this keyboard yes. fianza. Um, have you had any thoughts? Has anything jumped into your head about like what this, this manuscript might have been so for or about? Or? I think it's purely speculations because um, I should have been looking at some preface of editions or any kind of academic things being a musicology students, but kind of like I was so dwell, like I was really deep into 
the music itself, I just bury myself in the manuscript and did not go look at articles and stuff. But there's one thing that is really particular that I find from all these Faenza um, pieces is that they would actually repeat. So they would have multiple versions, multiple goals of writing this one polyphonic piece. So it makes me think as if it was like it were be, like they were done by different people and actually this is like a little um little collection of student work from different students and the teacher is rating them according to which is the best um go at interpolating this piece and so we have the first eight which are quite classic and Actually, if you look for Spotify or YouTube, everyone is just playing the first few mm. pieces out of the Enza. Um, and then you have to, and then you go back and there are more complex examples and the style kind of change a little bit, but there is some sort of like model that you can search from the little um, diminution, the little figures the that figures. they use, like the formulas, kind yeah. of repeats. Yeah. But then you kind of feel like maybe that's another person having a go at this. And maybe they're being ranked, <laughs> just like how we would rank them when we are playing it ourselves. And yeah, so it's all pure speculation, but I find this very um, interesting too. Yes, because there is really literally like a last more comes twice, a uh, jour, jour, the first piece also hmm. comes yeah. again. Um, yeah, and yeah, uh, exactly. this, this keeps happening. Yeah. yeah. And actually that makes sense if it's like sort of, um, if you say it's like a sort of academic work in the sense that's sort of pieces are yeah, made by students is it like yeah. involves a pedagogical because I was I was gonna ask sort of uh, do you think this is written for the keyboard yeah it does work very well on the keyboard yeah actually yeah so I try to play some of them on recorders and for some of them you really feel that it's really tricky yeah. and then you I mean not a keyboard keyboard but I play on okay that's what at least the right hand yeah and then everything works like it just goes yeah yeah, yeah. And for some of them, it feels like that, indeed. So I would say, yeah. yeah. Because my impression is is a bit like that, that on a keyboard, it's sort of very dramatic, even yeah. sometimes the formula. But um, then there's also the question, why is it written like it is? Because, if, for example, if I think of a, for example, if of a sort of keyboard intabulation, I would think of a more kind of intabulation, kind of, kind of, kind of, kind of score, you know, like, the, with either a system of a physical descriptive system of how, how to play like in which place of the instrument not necessarily like a stop but if if you say yeah i think it makes sense if you say that, like this is sort of academic work in a sense that uh how yeah. to make music and uh, why and also why doesn't mm, why does instrumental music have to be separately notated other yeah, yeah, than yeah. vocal music that's it yeah um, be like keyboard yeah. music being a very good reason because you actually have to look at two lines at the same time or three and then now you have to need to re-notate something that has already appeared in focal manuscript which is keyboard instruments so it mm. goes into this and then later the organ tablatures where you have to look at three lines and if they still do the part score thing then it's impossible especially for some of the organists who literally just know the organ yeah. tablature and don't know how to read menstrual na notation later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I think also for, for people, for instance, out there who are not specialists, it's also really interesting. Um, do I have an example here? Like... Which I believe in Basel, it's not a lot of people. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> the world. <laughs> the world. <laughs> <laughs> Through the lens of the camera. Um, that is true. Um, in manus the vocal manuscripts of the time, the parts were written out separately. So you had like the cantus line, du -du 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 -du, and then the tenor line, du -du 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 -du, and the contra tenor line. Du -du 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 -du. So um, you could never really see it as a full piece. But the fanzo is written really like keyboard music today. You have the, the right hand and the left hand on top of each other. And that's also in the 14th and 15th century, not so often done in mm -hmm. that way. Yeah. What it also reminds me of this, this sort of, and also the music, because most of these like sort of, you have a tenor, which is more or less almost copied, and then you have like sort of, you, it, it usually is the melody, which is very interesting. But it, it reminds me of, for example, something akin to what is in, in the, for example, the Berkeley treatise, 
which mm -hmm. I think is like yeah. third and seventh, is right? Where, where you have this this practice described of uh, almost like Lego like of saying, okay, for this note of the tenor, you can apply this formula, and yeah. it's and it, it's not it's not really something. It's not the same as, for example, later practice of like 16th century of, of diminuting a melody. It's it's really yeah, thinking it's really... for this note of the tenor you apply this. Yeah. It's let's call it, yeah. Let, let's call it a lick. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because of the river, so this note of the tenor you can apply this formula. This note of the tenor you can apply this formula. And and yeah, but I think perhaps this is the middle ground in a sense. The formulas are are always around the melody. There is one. Mm -hmm. But there's still formulas, like sort of very formulaic, like you were saying. There are formulas yeah. that you can identify, um, and they're and they're very keyboard-like. Yeah, that is true. And I think that's one of maybe one of the many reasons why they always mix up when they see the word organum, or they don't know oh. whether it's for organ mm -hmm. or organum, because organum works pretty much also in in the way where Vatican uh, Vatican organum trities or Berkeley they would be like having this tenor movement and then having mm -hmm. this, yeah, yeah. Um, here's how you make the first part. And then also in organ, it, these same figures come back and, and later there's the fundamentum mm -hmm. also even from uh, Paumann. So it's all like this kind of tenor movement against what kind of counters you can do. Mm -hmm. So I'm just waiting for some AI finds uh, to be uh, churned out. You could like. Just give yeah. it a tenor line and it will just uh, shove out the formulatic. Uh, kind shove of out to anyone who line. wants to. Yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think yes. They, yeah, they tried that with, with Schubert, don't they? That, like the unfinished symphony. Yeah. They tried to finish, finish it. it. So now we it's still unfinished. Just like that. Yeah. 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 Somebody interested in doing a doctoral thesis? <laughs> cool. So I think. That was lots of chatting, very nerdy chatting. So let's do some music now and uh, finish off these cocktails. <laughs> So this is, after all these really long, epic, huge form versions, this is a very short piece because we don't know what the vocal model was. We've only got the faenza left. So we're just going to go from the beginning to the end. And uh, it's a short and sweet way to come back into the music. It's uh, Vive Non Pui.
I'm going to invite Antonio to come and join us for the next piece. Where we also need... So this is another quite epic one because we're going to be doing the full form. Um, they really loved quite complex uh, poetic forms back in the day. And um, for the people out there who are not specialists, I always call it like this, the form that we it's a virile and it's like ABBA, A, because you have five lines of music. The first and the fifth are the same and they have the same music. And then this second, third and fourth are a bit like a verse. And you have fresh music, like B music, which is then repeated for the third text. But then the fourth line of text, it goes back and it uses the same music as the one and five, like the A music. So you have a kind of A, B, B, A, A, with these outer A's being kind of a bit, a bit like a chorus, or like a, at least a sort of a, a more profound thing that they want to say twice. And we are doing the full form, and we're mixing up the original polyphony and we're throwing in some Fienza. So on the second B and the, the A, you'll hear Fiona going crazy over here. And that's why, like me as an instrumentalist, I'm not a keyboard player, uh, but Fienza is really, really useful because like, you learn it and you play it and you get it in your fingers. And then when you play a really, really long form like this or vocal music, hopefully, eventually, your fingers just start adding all these like oodles. Naturally, you have a very organic way of learning how to ornament the vocal polyphony that you're playing. So, this piece is Au su, vu dormi trop, Madame Jolie. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>
so we come to the last two pieces that we're sandwiching together. And this is one where I have to play all the fast notes. <laughs> Finally. Finally. One organetto is not enough. Yes. <laughs> Um, yes, so sometimes you have these really epic long forms and then sometimes you have very short little untexted just like pieces which probably had some context like they just needed some music for a priest to get from A to B or from for whatever little reason and the first piece I'm going to do is one of these it's a very short untexted little piece and I'm coupling that together with the piece afterwards which is very similar in character and that's Jim Le Butte um, it's also very short. We also don't know what the vocal model is, uh, but they're a very fun little pair of pieces. thing we could do because in the manuscript right, the next piece is actually the same as the first piece we played today and as it's actually one of my favorite pieces I think uh, we could just do like five minutes of this yeah because yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you haven't heard too many notes tonight you know yeah. there's always time for more fast notes in your life It's 
isn't my favourite recorder that I get to play this one. So. Ah. <laughs> That's actually why. <clears throat> so this is kind of like the encore, and it's the final, um, the final French piece in the Fianza. So when we come back for part three, uh, you'll hear some crazy Italian trecento stuff. <laughs> 